Um, and I'm, I'm going to briefly give you a little, because I like to do the heartfelt, warm intro, and I let Kelly do our professional intro. So, Jessica Redmond has been our well, on the Wellness Council of Wisconsin for the last eight years. But for the last six years and eight months, we're counting on LinkedIn, by the way, um, they, she has been the executive director. But I like to go a little bit more into depth. She's actually married. She has two beautiful little girls that are eight and five years old. And um, I'm just going to relay a little story here quickly. That um, she, she asked her children recently, what do mommy and daddy do for a living? Well, daddy actually goes out and, and uh, he's a, a hedge fund trader. Okay, so, well, daddy makes money, was the answer. Well, yes, daddy does make money. And then, what does mommy do? Well, mommy um, actually, oh, where did oh, my quote I've got here? She works a lot. <laughs> she does work a lot. It's nice that she recognizes that all women work a lot. <laughs> so, um, also in her free time, Jessica does a lot of biking. So, we would like to invite her back to try some of our biking trails here in Chippewa. She hasn't had the pleasure of doing that yet. So, when you get a chance to speak for after the presentation, please invite her back to come biking with us. Too. At this time, I'd like to invite Kelly Belt from Prevea up. And she's going to do a little deeper introduction. Kelly? Uh, oh, you guys can clap for Kelly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, can you hear me? All right, so what I'm going to do this morning is just another brief introduction, but wanted to tell you a little bit about the Sheboygan County Activity and Nutrition Coalition and how we kind of got to worksite wellness and also to the goal of becoming a well county. Um, so there's a little bit of history I'm going to share with you before Jessica comes up to talk about winning worksite wellness practices. Um, so first, I guess first of all, who in the room has heard of Healthy Sheboygan 2020? Raise your hand. Good. And the Sheboygan County Activity and Nutrition Coalition? Okay, a little, a little fewer, okay. Um, we also call ourselves SEDAN, it's a little bit easier than Sheboygan County Activity and Nutrition Coalition. Um, so you'll hear me refer to it as SEDAN. And then also, just curious as to how many folks in the room um, either are currently or have participated in worksite wellness programs at work. Good, good number of you. Okay. Um, so to begin, again, the introduction. Okay, to the stand committee, uh, why worksite wellness, and then the overview of what my outline is today. Okay, use my cheat sheets as well. Okay, the stand committee is a Healthy Sheboygan County 2020 committee. It was established in May of 2003 as a result of receiving a maternal and child health grant from the state of Wisconsin. The premise of the grant was to promote public health nutrition leadership by forming nutrition coalitions that would focus on child obesity. As obesity is a multifactorial problem, the coalition attempts to utilize the socio-ecological model to evoke behavior change in areas of nutrition and physical activity among individuals, families, and our greater Sheboygan County. So SCAN has evolved a little bit since its inception, but what I'm telling you now is our current uh, mission statement, and that is to reduce the incidence of obesity and improve the health of children, families, and communities through education and promotion of healthy food choices, nutrition, and increased physical activity. So you'll see our little apple jump roping. <laughs> so we really are um, the branch of Healthy 2020 that focuses on the nutrition and activity. There's some other great committees working on mental health and alcohol and tobacco as well. So we're the activity and nutrition branch. <coughs> So you will see, um, if you visit our website, which by the way, the Healthy Sheboygan 2020 website has recently been updated, some really fantastic resources out here. I'd invite you to take a look at it if you haven't had a chance. 
Um, but just wanted to tell you a little bit about the current goals of the SCAN committee, and really, again, um, to promote the healthy lifestyle for all age groups, serve as a community resource to increase community exposure, education for local events. So here on our webpage, you'll find things like a winter activity guide, exercise programs in Sheboygan County, a consumer diet and lifestyle book review uh, from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So certainly something that we could all refer to um, either at work or at home. Many of us families in the wintertime tend to get cooped up, but with that winter activity list, there's a lot of really great resources. Another goal of the committee is to promote and encourage participation in the Employee Health and Fitness Day. Uh, this is an annual intercompany activity challenge that actually precedes the SCAD committee. Um, back in 1992 was the first time uh, the county had competed. There was a little break for a while, but since 2006, uh, companies have been competing. Last year, on May 21st, 28 Sheboygan County businesses competed, uh, reaching 17,000 employees. And then groups were awarded based on the size of the company, so small, medium, large, jumbo, and mega-sized employers. So less than 50 all the way up to 1,000 plus. So as a committee, um, we really enjoyed seeing the enthusiasm and um, excitement around the Employee Health and Fitness Day and um, recognize that worksite wellness really is a great way to reach folks, for us to be able to reach out to folks in the community. Most of us are spending about a third of our lives at work, right? Half of our waking hours. Um, so, you know, this is something, again, as the SCAN committee is looking at reducing obesity. Uh, the CDC has reported on the obesity trend throughout the United States here since 2011. You'll see, I um, don't know if you can see the numbers on the bottom, but you'll see that the light green, green are the better averages, meaning there are fewer states with the prevalence of obesity. The yellow is about mid-range, 25 to 30, and then orange and red um, are above between 30 and 35 and above 35 percent of people self-reporting um, on their statistics. So you'll see as we move on from 2011 to 12 to 13, um, we're seeing a lot fewer of the green, a um, little more yellow, a little more orange and red, so the trend is not going in the direction we would hope. Um, Of course, this is just one factor of um, good health that we look at, um, but I think impactful. So, in May of 2012, with the help of the Sheboygan Chamber, we put out a survey, and the purpose was to identify wellness activities that are currently underway by a variety of employers in Sheboygan County, and to identify their needs for the future. We did have 116 respondents, uh, just one contact per company. Um, we did have a lot of the respondents, about 75% were fewer than 50 employees. So small businesses, one person, two person uh, businesses, you are included and there's a lot of options available for you as well. Additionally, we had a number of um, a broad range of industries represented in from services to healthcare, manufacturing, retail, finance, hospitality, transportation, agriculture, mining, construction, forestry, wholesale, and other. All right, so some of the things we were able to find out are what are some of the barriers, barriers preventing companies from having worksite wellness programs? <clears throat> You can see here, a large percent don't have time or staff to dedicate. Uh, they have lack of funding and lack of employee interest or motivation. We asked them what tools or resources would be helpful. Uh, many of them said they'd like a person to talk to for ideas and advice, sample education materials, a summary of how to get started, how to evaluate a wellness program. Um, additional things we asked for additional input other than the questions that were listed. Um, folks asked us to provide more awareness, to organize events to promote health, um, increase activity nutrition effort, efforts by low-income, underemployed, and elderly. So many, many more great suggestions. All right, so we realized we had some
something um, with the worksite wellness uh, as, as a focus for us moving forward. And so what happened is the SCAN committee created a subcommittee who's been focused on worksite wellness. And um, if you are here from the committee, I'm going to introduce you and ask you to stand, please. Um, so myself, of course, Kelly Bell with Purveya Health. Um, we have Amy Becky, who is there. She's with um, Sheboygan County. Uh, Barb Fireche, who is not here today, uh, but she is a community advocate and is also a member of the committee. Donna Wedland, uh, who's not here today, but I saw my firm. There you are. <laughs> yes, so, okay, I don't, the YMCA. Also, Jerry Drykosen with the school district. There's Jerry. Uh, Julie Meyer with Hub International. Kevin Donnelly from Aurora. Uh, Sherry Samuels first from Sargento. There's Sherry. And then Jean Pittner, who is also not here today with Sheboygan County. So these folks are committed to bringing you all resources uh, for worksite wellness. Okay, so, um, and think about how we could bring you the best resources. We took a look at what's already available. Um, the Wisconsin Department of Health Services has a great worksite wellness template on their website. We invited them to come a couple of years ago to talk about their resources. Um, and then, Last year, I invited the Wellness Council of Wisconsin to come and tell us about the resources that they have available. Um, so, WellCOA is the Wellness Council of America. It's a nationwide organization that focuses on being the premier leader of worksite health and wellness. Um, the Wellness Council of Wisconsin is a really great supporter and local advocate for everything that WellCOA offers. So, we're very lucky to have the Wellness Council here in Wisconsin. All right, so as a committee, we realized all the great things that Wellcoa are doing. Um, and we recognize that we would like to become a Well County. So what does it mean to become a Well County? It means we need 20 employers who employ at least 20% of our population to be identified as Well Workplaces. And Jessica's gonna tell you about what it means uh, to be, become a Well Workplace. Um, but let me tell you, Sheboygan, I believe we are ready for this. Um, we saw that we had 17,000 people participate in the last year's 2000, uh, or 2014 Employee Health and Fitness Day. Um, in January, we took a look at our workforce. We had 62,400 people in Sheboygan County. 20% would be 12,480 individuals um, participating in worksite wellness. So I think we're ready. We just need to be recognized for some great things we're already doing and I think um, kind of spread the excitement and hopefully new organizations can also take advantage of the worksite wellness. So, I knew I was going to talk a little longer. <laughs> but um, we wanted to talk a little bit about, again, why worksite wellness, but we really truly believe there are organizational and community rewards. Um, creates, we'd love to be able to create uh, a culture of healthy living here in Sheboygan County, support individual rewards, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment, but of course it improves our physical and mental health, increases productivity, reduces absenteeism, uh, we have cost savings on medical plans, aids in recruitment and retention, and of course we believe that will all lead to economic growth, and um, we have evidence that that has done so. Um, again, uh, the Well City Initiative is nationwide through WellCOA. Currently, there's only 13 communities who have been designated as Well Cities. Um, we are going for the Well County designation. Um, however, Wisconsin is a leader in this initiative. You'll see of the 13, the city of Milwaukee, Racine, Fox Cities, and Oshkosh have all been designated with Fond du Lac and La Crosse in process. And hopefully next year you'll see Sheboygan. More on work, why worksite wellness. Um, we talk about the individual rewards. And you'll see on the tables here we have uh, something that came out of the Wellness Council of Wisconsin conference last fall. And it's really being able to identify why would someone want to participate in worksite wellness. And I believe that if we can really engage individuals on an individual level, um, they're going to be more likely to uh, provide a good example for folks that 
are around them and within the workplace and in their families and with their friends. Um, you know, for me, I would invite you to also consider why you would like to live well. For me, I have two little girls that I want to be an ex a good example for. I want them to know what making healthy choices looks like. Um, but, you know, some great thoughts that came out of that, folks who they had a long bucket list or they wanted to have an active retirement. There's lots of reasons why we should all choose to live well. And you know, you may not ever be a marathon runner or a vegan or, and I don't ever plan to be either of those. Um, <laughs> there are some steps we can all take, some small steps to better health. Okay. So I just want, again, uh, invite you to, to make a difference. Become familiar with the website at Healthy Sheboygan 2020. We will have our third annual Worksite Wellness Workshop um, on April 30th at the UW Sheboygan campus. Please visit the resource tables here today as well on your way out. Um, again, Employee Health and Fitness Day is coming up on May 20th. We would invite you to participate in that as well. And then um, ask that you promote the Sheboygan County initiative within your organization and business circle. Now. We do have cards here as well, so if you wanted to ask questions for the speaker or for the scan committee or anything throughout, please feel free and we'll collect them. And now, no, Jessica, come on, I'm going to do your quick introductions. Jessica Radovan is the Executive Director of the Wellness Council of Wisconsin, a statewide nonprofit organization whose vision is to improve health and empower business. With a career spanning 15 years, Jessica applies her industry expertise as a healthcare consultant and corporate wellness strategist. In addition, as a wellness leader in Wisconsin, Jessica serves as a member of multiple statewide coalitions to advance worksite wellness along with addressing risk factors such as obesity. Jessica holds a Bachelor's of Science in Community Health Education, a Certified Health Education Specialist designation, and a Wisconsin resident life and accident and health insurance license. Okay. Yeah. I got lots of wires here. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Well, thank you for inviting me to your first Friday forum. Um, I have a lot to cover in a very short time. So I've been asked today to talk to you a little bit about who the Mullins Pump of Wisconsin is, some of the resources that we have available. Are we okay? Sounds okay. Some of the resources we have available throughout this conversation today, and I hope it is a conversation because I really want you to participate and ask questions, I'm going to share some best practices. And then in addition to that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Kelly did a great job in pretensing is that Wells County initiative. So strap in and let's go, right? So. Okay. So as Kelly said, our, our vision for our organization is to improve health to empower business. And this is our 30th year as an organization. We were established in 1985 as a nonprofit membership organization. We have over 600 members throughout the state of Wisconsin today. We started with nine founding members back in 1985. As Kelly has mentioned to you, we are the local affiliate of the national organization WOLCOA, Wellness Council of America, and they're based out of Omaha, Nebraska. So one of the great things that we have the benefit of as our members have access to all of WOLCOA's information, tools, and resources. And that's one of the things that I've been asked to talk to you about today. But before I go, our value proposition <coughs> for our members and statewide, we don't just help our members, we like to help the entire state, is really to help you as a wellness practitioner or a representative of your organization to learn, connect, and grow. To help your employees get healthy. And then it's your turn to take this information back to your work site to help your employees learn, connect, and grow. So um, I like to put this picture up because sometimes we'll get questions and of course this is what I do for a living so inside I'm I'm laughing, right? But people say, well, is this something that's really catching on? Is worksite wellness really out there? And here is a picture that I'd like to show you. So this year is our, again, for a 30-year organization, it's our 25th annual worksite wellness conference. 
It's a statewide conference, and we have five to 600 people attending on an annual basis. So I don't know about you, but I think something's going on in the state of Wisconsin with worksite wellness. What do you think? Yeah. I think so. <coughs> so I want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about the Wellco resources that are available to you. How many of you in this room are currently members of the Wellness Council of Wisconsin? We, I know we have quite a few. One of the things when we're members of organizations, we get so busy that we forget what's out there. So this is a great reminder for those of you that aren't members, I have some great things that you can access to, to as well. But very pragmatically, our organization offers a wealth of resources. Actually, if you tested me, I probably could only tell you about a quarter of all the resources that are out there. I have my favorites, so there's so much out there. But some things that you can use immediately, we have newsletters, we have surveys, we have samples, we have interest surveys, we have checklists. And then from a best practice perspective, we constantly are putting out expert interviews and case studies, what's happening nationwide and what's happening locally. So if you want to learn about what XYZ company is doing out there as it relates to incentives or culture or engagement, all those key words that we hear about, this is the place to go. And if you have questions about those, you just contact our office and I could probably send you in a matter of 30 minutes about 10 articles related specifically to whatever topic that you're looking at. It could be wellness teams, no matter what it is. There's a wealth of tools and resources that are available to you. One of the great things for those organizations that are not members is you can take a test drive. We have a five day trial out there where you can get out there, you can download and save anything that you want and we'll never know about it. The other thing is, you know, I come to these presentations um, at associations and chamber events, and someone gets up there and talks about all these great services that they have, and then they say, by the way, you have to buy our membership to access our tools and resources. One of the things that WellCoa is known for, as well as us, is we give away so many free resources. Sometimes our resources that are for our members don't tell anybody this, um, go out on free resources first for a short period of time before they go into the members only website. So we encourage you to get out there and take that five day test trial. I'll talk about the checklist um, a little bit towards the end. So one of the things I know in this room, we don't really need to make the case, but I do want to um, spend a little time talking to you about our um, employees that are at our organization. And I'm gonna get on my soapbox a little bit because I am standing on a box up here. But ultimately, um, I can stand up here, and, and Kelly did a great job of this, telling you why worksite wellness is so important. We could give obesity statistics to our employees, but what happens when we do that at our work sites? We say 75% of the population, we're in jeopardy of 75% of the population becoming mm -hmm. obese in the next five years. We give some people permission, or tell them it's okay, to be in the norm, right? I would rather be in the 25% in the that's not, but if we walk around and tell all these people all these statistics, they're gonna say, well, that's okay. That's okay, because I'm with everybody else. So let's take a look at this. This is kind of fun. This is uh, what I would like to say, a day of life in one of our employees. So an American commuter spends 38 hours a day stuck in, 38 hours, oh my gosh, a year, stuck in traffic. Well, Sheboygan might be a little bit different than Milwaukee, but I can relate to that. The average number of Americans killed annually by vending machines falling on them, 13. I, don't, I can't make this up, right? I can't make this up. At 4 p.m., three quarters of Americans have no idea what they'll have, di what they'll have for dinner. And I'm in the industry, and I get at 3.52 a text from my husband every day, what's for dinner? And I say, I don't know, what are you making? <laughs> so what happens when we don't know what we're having for dinner with an eight-year-old and a five-year-old at home? We all know what happens, right? So every single hour of television watch after the age of 25 reduces the viewer's life expectancy by 21.8 minutes. Scary, isn't it? By comparison, smoking a single cigarette reduces life expectancy by about 11 minutes. So we get why they say sitting is the new smoking, right? That would support that. So then, when we're outside of work and all of us go on vacation, more than half, 52% of us U.S. employees say they're planning to work 
during their summer vacations this year. Okay? So what do you guys think about that? It's scary, isn't it? A day in the life of our employees. So this might be hard for you to see in the back, but this is myself here and Lisa Thierman. She's our member service manager in our office. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit, okay, we saw that lifestyle, what our employees are faced up against in um, the workplace. Now I want to talk about what we as employers have done to make our employees more productive, right? Because that's what it's all, all, all about, right? Our employees help us make money at our work site. And a little bit about environmental engineering. So you can see here, I don't have great posture, if you can see this, I'm kind of bent over, I'm sitting down. And then here, I rolled over to the other side of my desk and I'm filing something, but I'm still sitting down. About two weeks ago, our organization had standing desks installed for two of our employees. We're a three-person organization. Who do you think didn't get the standing desk? Yeah. <laughs> so she has, we all wear Fitbits in the office. She has noticed, now this is an uncontrolled experiment, in the last two weeks, on average, a 2,000 step increase by just standing at her desk. And we all were just in awe of that. Do you believe that? It's amazing. But what she said is, she will walk over the three steps to the printer, she will walk over to, you know, file something, whereas what am I doing here? I'm rolling, I'm rolling. And we, as employers, have created this for our employees, right? I don't know if we can blame the manufacturers who create our office furniture, but we have done this. We have helped our employees have this lifestyle when they're at work. That's better than statistics, isn't it? Better than statistics. So, why? What, what is this all about? Making the case, like it or not, employers are in the healthcare business. Lifestyle is both our culprit and our cure. And this last bullet here, employer is not focusing on lifestyle. They are not managing the major contributors to healthcare costs. And I think we're all in this room here today and we believe that. Ultimately, I put two um, pictures on here. This one on the bottom is a magazine from 1964. It's called The Look. And it's difficult for you to see these headlines, but what's interesting is these headlines really are not that different from the headlines that we have today. It says, um, why are our medical bills so big? Um, do you really want a family doctor? Why don't prepaid plans cover you? So if we looked at those today, we're finding that the changes that we're making to our medical plans are just not working. So that is why we're here to talk about worksite wellness. So we've done the copay increases, we've changed our networks, we've increased our deductibles, we've even added on-site clinics to our organization. What I want to tell you is we need to define our worksite wellness programs in this manner to make sure that we're getting the results that we want. So here's the definition. So now we're going to transition from you know some of those resources out there talk a little bit about the well workplace process. So, it's organized, it's carefully planned, and properly implemented. And I'm going to give you the framework today of what that looks like. It addresses both what the organization needs and what the employees want. That's really, really important to that engagement perspective. It's not activity-centered, right? It's not just about um, doing things because it sounds like a good thing. We're doing them because we know it's going to affect the organization and impact the employees. It's results oriented. And it includes a number of common elements that are inherent in every successful worksite wellness program. And I'm going to get to that right now. So here for small businesses, we've designed our national organization, WOLCOA Wellness Health America, has studied businesses for over 30 years. And they've identified those common elements that are inherent in every organization that their program is generating outcomes. That means it works. It's giving them the outcomes that that business wants. So here's 10 steps that a small business can do. I'm not gonna go through these because essentially they do mirror the uh, seven step process for large businesses. But what I wanna say about this is we've seen in a trend that many small businesses will start here. 
and it's based on <coughs> the amount of resources, time, and money that they have available. But ultimately, they will transition over to the seven-step process, which is right here. So capturing senior-level support, creating cohesive uh, wellness teams, collecting data, crafting an operating plan, choosing appropriate interventions, creating supportive environments, and carefully evaluating outcomes. Don't fear, I'm not going to go through every single one of these today, but I want to share with you the power of this process. So some of you, where's Jerry in the room? I'm giving you another chance at this, Jerry. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something fun, and I want to share it with you. So does everybody have a pen? If you have a pen, grab it. We're going to walk through this. This is something you can do at the dinner table tonight with the rest of your family. Okay, so pick a number between 2 and 9 and write it down. <laughs> Multiply... Slow down a little bit. Multiply your number by nine and write it down. Add those two digits together. So six plus three, for example. And then subtract five from your number and once again, write it down. So match your number to the corresponding letter of the alphabet. So for example, if it's four, it's C. Think of a country in Europe that starts with this letter. I'll give you an extra second on this one. Think of an animal that begins with the last letter of your country's name. This is not a psychology experiment either. So think of a color that begins with the last letter of your animal's name. Okay, Jerry got it. Do you want to tell him? What, what's the answer? Orange kangaroo in Denmark. <laughs> so how many of you got an orange kangaroo in Denmark? Wow, but I think this has probably been the most I've ever had in a group. I think there is actually one other alternative that you can get. I, don't, I haven't figured out what it is. I haven't taken the time. But ultimately, this is pretty cool, right? This was kind of a, a great brain teaser for the day. An orangutan. Oh, in Denmark. Okay. An orange orangutan. No, sorry, no. Sorry. <laughs> we'll rethink that. <laughs> but this, what I wanted to show with this is this is the power of the process. We all, pretty much all of us, came to the same conclusion, right? Because we followed this process. For worksite wellness, the process is the seven C's. And the success, our orange Denmark and kangaroo, is outcomes, right? Because that's why we're doing worksite wellness programs, is to have outcomes. Whatever outcomes mean to your organization, it could be some of these things, right? So you see here the title of this slide says, The Benefits of Worksite Health Promotion. Now, the graph below it isn't exactly the slide that I would normally put under the benefits of worksite health promotion. But what this slide represents is a study that we did. We had about a 50% response rate of all of our members last year. And this is the, the question that was asked is what motivates you to offer worksite wellness in your organization? But what I found is the answers were similar. But let's take a look at this a little bit closer. And I know in this area, what's driving worksite wellness um, promotion is really healthcare costs. But statewide, we're actually seeing employee health as a motivator for wellness programs. So then we jump down to healthcare costs. But what's interesting is we see employee morale, work life, company image as some of the top motivators for worksite wellness programs. Isn't that interesting? It's about what our employees think about when they come to work, right? We want to make it more than them valuing their job and their paycheck, right? We want to make it a place that they're happy and they're healthy and they come to work and they do a good job. So I found this really interesting. Then the other piece I want to point out here that's a little bit on the lower end is the recruitment um, and the retention rate. And this is something that we've seen more and more with employers, why they're even starting worksite wellness programs is, 
how do we keep the good employees at our organization, and how do we attract new employees? And what I found interesting, I went on a number of websites, some of these might look familiar to you, and I found from their career section this information. At Johnsonville, we believe in protecting and encouraging our members' health and fitness through the promotion of our wellness culture. I didn't take this from their operating plan. I took this if, as I was going to their website to look for a job. Okay, so we can see that people are using corporate wellness as a way to attract employees. We have Sargento, it's more than just a paycheck, health and investment. We invest in our employees to help them stay healthy and achieve work-life balance. Employee health and wellness. Through wellness programs, education, counseling, and assessment, employee health and wellness services strive for a high level of health and wellness among employees. So my challenge would be to go back to your organizations and find out, are you linking the health of your employees to your strategic imperatives at your organization? Is that displayed publicly? Is your CEO talking about it? Is your president talking about it? Is it part of your recruitment package as you're looking to bring employees at your work site? What's interesting, and this probably happens with a lot of businesses, ultimately is your trading employees, aren't you? Do you trade employees back and forth? So as business presidents and CEOs, we're probably asking yourself, we want the healthy employees at our organization, right? Because they're going to be more productive, they're going to cost us less in healthcare costs. So wouldn't it be great if all of our organizations were healthy and we all passed healthy employees back and forth, and we'll talk about that right now. So this is the power as we transition out of the well workplace process this is the Well City, Well County, USA initiative. This is really a powerful process where we ultimately can work together as an entire business community. So our organization over 30 years has been working with one employer at a time to help them through that Well Workplace process. Well, COA back in the 90s developed this um, program called Well City, Well County, Well Region, Well State, whatever you want to call it, um, to help us as a business community help employees work through this process together. Because collectively, we know we can be more successful if we do this together. So our goal is to work with business and community leaders like yourself to make your workforce one of the healthiest in America. And you see here the benefits of a Well County initiative mirror that of the benefits of a wellness program. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the requirements of a Well County initiative. One of the things is um, we do require that we work with a task force within that business community. Because how would it look if I walked in, Miss Jessica, and said, I want to start this program in your community, but yet I've never even been on the bike trails in your community. You're going to laugh at me, right? You're going to say, well, you don't know anything about who we are, what we do, and our culture. But what I do know about is worksite wellness. And I do know what others within the state are doing. And that's the assistance that our organization can bring here. Um, but ultimately, this initiative is led by a business task force um, within your community. We have a, a bunch of different requirements here where um, in order for the program to be sustainable, we ask that task force to go through a pre-application process. So we say, is your community really ready for this? Once they make it through that pre-application process, then we say, okay, now you write a strategic plan, okay? Because wellness is business, right? We need to treat it as such. So there's a, a strategic plan, and along with that is that 2020 rule that Kelly talked about. At that point in time, we require 20% of the, 20 employers representing a minimum of 20% of the workforce to have signed on to the initiative. That means that during this, when the initiative lasts for 36 months, that during that time, these employers commit to adopting the well workplace process, that seven bench framework we just went through, um, and then applying for a well workplace award. At the end of that 36 month time period, if every organization has gone through that, or that minimum of 20 employers representing 20% of the workforce, we then can call your community one of the healthiest in America, a Well County USA um, 
project. So I went through that pretty fast, but it's, I see a lot of shaking of the heads here. One thing I want to make sure that I get to is tell you about some of the other initiatives. So as Kelly said, these are our active initiatives right now. Um, Milwaukee and Racine are in their second round. So they're going through, they're in, actually, uh, Milwaukee's in their sixth year of the project, so they certainly found value to that. And Fox Cities and Oshkosh are re-upping their second round. So they've both all been designated. Fondelec is into their 16th month of the initiative, and we have Lacrosse La signing on shortly here in the next month or so. So this is a case study from Racine from employers that have been through the process, and I've uh, bolded some of the words that I want you to pay attention to. So 100% of the employers that went through the initiative were proud to be part of the Well City USA achievement. It's not to say that there wasn't work that went into that, certainly, but they were proud in, in that process. 100% said it was a valuable framework for creating a comprehensive wellness program. And 94% either strongly agreed or agreed that it added motivation and accountability to their program. 100% said that they will re-engage their leadership to continue on into the initiative. So something good is going on, right? And one of the things that I love about this project is, once again, you as employers could do this all by yourself, but the project really allows you to come together on a regular <coughs> basis so you can go through it together. You can share what's working, share what isn't working, share resources, share programs even, um, and then it really catapults your program forward. Milwaukee, you can see here that they've had um, positive shifts in all their risk statuses. They've um, increased their longevity for their programs. We have return on investment, Hellway Carbon Products, which is a mid-sized company, estimates an ROI of $1.60, saved in healthcare per dollar spent. And again, this was back in 2010, so they've seen even more dramatic increases from that. PH Mining, or Joy Global, added a stretching program into their organization, and they saw improvements in re reduced loss time by 100% from 2009 to 2010. So those are just some of the results that some of our employers experienced. So let's just move into some best practices really quickly here. Um, one of the things in my title I said, if you build it, right, they will come. And that's what this is all about. We know that if you just build the program, it's not just going to happen, right? We have to put that process in place and find out what our employees want, ultimately. So again, just to remind you what the seven C's are, and I'm going to go through a couple of these slides for you. So I think the premise of that seven-step process is really about collecting that data, that health risk assessment, finding out from our employees what their risks are. Okay, Maybe the biometrics tell us their risks that they don't even know. Their interest survey is asking employees what they value about themselves. What do they want from the worksite wellness program? And then your culture audit. Does the organization, and this is important, does your organization administer a health culture audit? Why is this so important? Out of all this data, I would promise you that the culture audit is probably one of the most significant pieces that if you're not doing today, you will find more about your organization through this health culture audit than you might even through your health risk assessment if you've been doing those for a while. So let's define that real quickly here. Your culture comprises an organization's climate, your values, your norms, and your beliefs. It comes down to a common way of thinking and acting, right? That's your culture. And it's just the way we get things done. What co what's difficult about culture is we can't measure it. We don't know what it is. But if someone walked into your work site, they certainly probably could tell you what their culture is. So for example, if we saw when we walked into an organization, uh, to eat or be eaten, what do you think the culture might be there? A little bit, a little competitive, right? Or we walked into an organization and then they had ping pong tables and they were all dressed in jeans. We would understand their culture, right? Do you understand how your culture at your organization affects the behaviors that your employees have? That's your biggest question. 
I could tell you stories and stories and stories about how health culture can actually damage. But ultimately, these are some statistics that we have. We know that the culture within your organization, remember, we talked about climate, values, norms, and beliefs. They also dictate behaviors. We saw before that environmental engineering, is it, is it a culture for people to get away from their desk and go for a walk? Or does that appear that people are not working at your organization? Okay, so those are just some examples. But here we have some statistics from the 2004 <laughs> Health Mindset study where they show a strong culture and a weak culture and then relate that to having an annual physical last year. In a strong culture, 72% of people had a physical. In a weak culture, 64%. They exercise at least three times per week. 62% exercise in a strong culture, 49% exercise in a weak culture. I don't know what more else I can say about how much your culture impacts that. Zappos here. We know that Zappos has a uh, happiness wellness officer at their organization, and they take wellness very seriously. You can see here at the bottom that they have six less, six less six days per year. Say that ten times fast. Six less six days per year. We would all take that, wouldn't we, at our organization? Health culture is something that I can talk about all day, and we can have a lot of fun with. Um, and maybe we can come back and do that at another time. Uh, this, I think, many of you have seen, but a lot of you haven't as well. I'm not going to play it today, but I encourage you to get out there. So we talk about how culture and environment impact the choices our employees are making. This is a great video that you can go out on YouTube and see. When they started the video, they showed that this is a subway, and people on a regular basis chose what? You can see the escalator. I chose the escalator, then overnight they uh, put a piano, a working piano, on the stairs, and they saw in one day an increase of 66% usage of the stairs. So again, it's that environmentally engineering. I was at a presentation the other day, and it's a, the organization had a long-standing program, and he stood in front of a group of people and said the hardest thing that our organization had to do with our worksite wellness program was get rid of the candy dish. It's those little things that when you go back to your organization today, I challenge you to walk around and say, does our culture and does our environment <coughs> support the lifestyle changes that we're asking our employees to make at this organization? We're asking them to help drive down our health care costs. We want them to better utilize the emergency room, be good consumers of their health care, but yet our culture is that we're dictating that people are there five hours after the doors close at our organization. So I have two quick questions. Where do you get a staircase like that? And what could you put out in place of the candy dish? Fruit. Fruit. So when customers come into my office, I give them candy because everybody loves candy. Right? <laughs> Apples or yeah, absolutely. Or even dark chocolate. Little bits of dark chocolate. If, if you feel that's something that you can't take away, you know, turn it around to a more helpful opportunity for them. You know, these, these changes that we're asking them to make are very, very uncomfortable. So you have to look at the culture within your organization as well and just decide how quickly you want to do that. If that's something that's really predominant at your organization, maybe don't take it away right away. Get them involved. Have them help you make decisions on what would be better alternatives for them than um, having the, the candy dish. So there's all those little things that you can do. We have wonderful trails. We promote. We ask people to, to get up. One of the polls that I want to share with you, or that one of the statistics I wanted to share with you with that, um, the environmental engineering slide with our staff and the workstation, we did a poll of our members last year. 83% of our companies either have or considering or allow their employees by request to have a standing workstation. So that's not just something that our organization does. 83% of companies are considering having that at their organizations. We've seen organizations with treadmills as well. So before I, I leave, I do want to just encourage you. Um, one of the things when we talk about engagement, and engagement is a, a huge buzzword, and again, we could talk for six hours, 
on engagement alone, but I do want to encourage you um, to think about the power of making wellness personal. Many of our organizations have, this is something that we launched at our conference last year, this Live Well campaign. It's something for you that you can download on our website if you're a member or non-member, and it provides all the tools and resources, and as Kelly mentioned, you have many of them at your table. But it's about, again, asking your employees, why do they want to live well? When we offer some of our programs at our organizations, when I was a wellness practitioner in the field, I remember putting a flyer out that said, heart health, come learn about your LDL and HDL. Do you think that's something that would appeal to you? <laughs> not today, right? It's not something that would appeal to us. So we have to ask our employees, why would they want to live well? You know, sometimes it's amazing what we find out. At our conference, we had um, a, a photographer there who was taking pictures, and one of the young women in the crowd said, she lives well because she is recovering from uh, a, a eating disorder, and that she wants to be able to tell people that it's okay whatever size you are. Do we know that about our, our employees? We probably don't know what's going on with our employees. So if they say, I want to lose 10 pounds to be at my daughter's wedding, or I want to dance a lot with my grandchildren, those are the things that get your employees excited. Not Heart Health 101, right? <coughs> so, wow, we could talk forever, couldn't we? But I, I'm gonna get the chain quick soon. So, at this time, um, I'll just mention to you, we do have a checklist. You can go on um, our website and take that, and we'll contact you and say, hey, let's talk a little bit more about your worksite wellness <coughs> program. This is a listing of all those 80 companies who are current well workplace award winners with our organization. And anybody have any questions? I wasn't trying to give you the chance. I was trying to encourage you to get back here to ask questions. So, does anybody have any questions? I think she's perfect also, but you know, that's not just to that point. Can you go through the checklist a little bit, Jessica, since that's their first step? Sure, absolutely. So the checklist is 100 questions. And it's sectioned off by the seven benchmarks. So we'll ask you questions about senior level support, your wellness team, and then you will get a numerical score for each of those benchmarks. And that really serves as an opportunity for us to talk about how you're doing within each of those benchmarks. What's interesting is sometimes we encourage you to have uh, maybe your wellness team take it or some senior leadership take it because oftentimes we'll find that the answers vary pretty significantly. So sometimes we'll see that uh, the, the CEO thinks that they have tremendous senior level support, but the wellness team might not. So that's a great opportunity to have discussion on why is that and to come together and address those particular problems. So I have a question regarding um, the Wisconsin <coughs> alcohol. So the CDC has identified Wisconsin as the number one binge drinking state in the country and pretty much held that uh, reputation for many years. Right. And you go out to the stores and you see shirts drink responsibly. Is this you know, encouraging our reputation to drink a lot? Of course, in my courtroom, I see a lot of alcohol violations. And uh, so people, especially in Sheboygan County, where again, we've been identified by the state of Wisconsin as being one of the top drinking, uh, highest percentage of drinkers in the state. Um, this is an issue, I think, and uh, that culture, I heard a presentation by the University of Wisconsin-Madison a few years ago. They put together a study and came down with the reason that we're doing this is basically because it's in our culture. And so how are businesses, of course, they're so affected by people coming come over or unable to work. Do uh, you address that somehow, or I'm just curious? Yeah, you know what, each individual organization, based on their risks that's identified through that data, will um, hopefully address what those risks are. So health risk assessment, um, depending on the health risk assessment that an organization does, will usually ask, you know, how often they drink, um, those types of questions. So as an organization, I think many of us have identified that that is a concern. Um, and usually are just using, from my experience, their EAP to address that from an intervention perspective. I can't say that we've had many organizations where I've seen a specific 
intervention on um, alcohol usage. Yeah, and I'm talking more about like you talked about the company's culture. What are right. they, what is the message the company is giving their employees about maybe alcohol or is, is there messaging? I don't know. Every time there's a party, okay, let's somebody exactly. somebody's retiring. Let's go to the bar and have a drink. Right. right. Instead yeah. of having non-alcohol based. You know, does alcohol have to be involved in everything we do here? Right. And, you know, some of that comes down to, I know there's probably a disclaimer on all of those that says this is not a company-sponsored event, but who's going to be that first person to say, hey, let's go, you know, to the park and have um, a picnic and, you know, do something healthy. healthy. I, I just want to add something to that. There was someone that was retiring a few years back, and I was just going to stop in real quick, have a soda, and I remember one of the guys saying, just a soda? And I said, no, I don't feel comfortable. I'm only here for a very brief time. I'm not having a drink and then leaving. So it's going to take a long time for that culture to change. To change. Right. And I would just add to that, you know, we do see the professors that we do uh, as well, that um, we are always above the national, almost always above the national norms in the with the amount of drinking that we're doing. And, you know, we've had, and even in those meetings, sometimes there's a giggle about it and things like that because it's been accepted in our culture. Um, but I would look to uh, what the Healthy Sheboygan 2020 Committee, the Alcohol and Drug Committee, as well as mental health uh, group, see what resources that they might have available for employers to locally. I know you've heard too much from me as it is already, but I did want to give you some hope, and the hope is that our family, for many years, has always been water drinkers. We don't even drink soda at our house. We don't drink beer. We don't drink wine. We don't drink anything. Just because I have health issues to do with all the rest of that stuff. But um, we have three teenagers who are all in high school now, and this year, for the first time, we decided we'd host the theater cast party. Oh dear goodness, a hundred teenagers coming down to our house, and. Our kids were like, are we getting soda? I said, absolutely not. We have water. We have bottles of water. I will put out bottles of water. You know what? Nobody questioned it. Everybody grabbed bottles of water. They were so excited they wanted to go back for more water. Nobody questioned it. I think we have the basis for starting that movement. And the kids were totally cool with it. Not one kid got up and left. They all stayed. So I think we've got the chance. When companies implement this program, is it usually required additional staff, some sort of, do they usually assign this to somebody within the company? It depends. Um, we know that we have some statistics and some of these polls that I've mentioned, there's a handout at the um, purveyor table in the back. Um, but we know that employers are spending about 25% of their time working on a worksite wellness program. I would say that there, there needs to be more time spent on that. Um, and then there's also a recommendation. We have some recommendations that I can share with you about number of FTEs and the number of staff that you can commit. But most of the time, um, it does get lumped into the HR department, and then an individual is assigned within the HR department um, to carry out that task. I would say the majority of Wisconsin programs are run like that. We feel otherwise, but <laughs> maybe we'll change that. Yeah, you had listed projects. There's, what, six cities in, in Wisconsin right now, and they have projects that last for about three years. Could you give us a couple examples of what those projects look like? Sure. Um, every project is really different because it's based on what the uh, community needs. The Fox Cities project, for example, really focused on pulling in the school districts. Um, the Fox Cities project has 16 different cities that encompass that project, and one of their main messaging was um, what the messages that are happening in the work site are the same messages that are happening in the schools, and then the families are coming home and eating dinner together and talking about those messages. So they worked really hard within that community to make sure that would ha that would happen. Um, they also had some really unique projects that they had. They had uh, an adopt an employer project, where, um, or excuse me, adopt a, a student project, where they encouraged students within that, those school districts to put forth uh, idea, grant ideas for wellness within their classrooms or their schools. 
and there was some amazing things that happened. There were pedometer programs, there were um, the fitball chairs that were um, being introduced in the classroom, and these were, you know, hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollar um, grants that were given by businesses in that community to those employees. We're not talking significant dollars, but it really allowed the 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 children in those communities to understand what was going on. Um, Milwaukee is, is a different um, project in itself. They actually have a paid staff person that is leading that project. They have over 68 employers that have committed at some time or another to that project and actually extend outside the confines, the confines of the, the city project. Um, that's really been an, an amazing initiative because of the magnitude of it. We're seeing it's, we've always been right on the cusp of about 22 employers. At one time, I think we were up at 24 employers that committed. It's a smaller community um, with smaller work sites. Um, so that one has, you know, operated a little bit different. As far as the budget that that project has had, I don't think we've ever seen their um, bank account go over $1,500. So they've been really been able to do some magnificent things at a, you know, on, a, on a shoestring budget to support that initiative. There's a lot more that goes into the um, Sheboygan County, or for example, Sheboygan County Initiative. Um, we, the Business Task Force, would develop that strategic plan. Um, we would figure out ways to get together on a um, you know, bi-monthly, quarterly basis to really help the employers work through the process. They become members of our organization, so we support them through the technical support there. So there, there's a lot of support with each of those projects. Great question. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, we'd like to give you about 10 minutes to um, be able to uh, go back and check out all the resources that have been so graciously provided to you today down at the back table. Um, so please make sure you stop by that resource table and take advantage of all the information that's been left out for you. Um, just a couple of reminders. Um, February 18th is our focal point. Um, it is the Five Star Services um, conversation that's going to be happening. February 26th, for you, um, we are having the Chamber Gala. I hope you all have your tickets already. So it's going to be a wonderful night. And then the last, um, the next uh, First Friday Forum is going to be March 6th, where we're going to be talking about the new school report card and how it relates to addressing the skills gap in business. So the last thing that I want to leave on your tables today is if you haven't had a chance to go to any of the FOSS which is the business or our business success strategy table for uh, business owners, or to the success roundtables for sales or HR. Those are going on at the beginning, uh, starting next week, right, John? We have a couple of those heading out. So we invite you all to come and try out the success uh, success strategy tables. They are a wonderful way of getting um, to uh, sit down with each other and gather information. So once again, Jessica, thank you so much. Kelly, thank you again. Um, a round of applause, please. please. And I hope you have a delightful weekend. Drive safely and make sure you check out our resource tables. Thank you.